Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today it's time to get back to my regular response video shtick, so I dove straight to the bottom of the barrel to pick on Kent Hovind. He recently had a very amusing discussion with Aaron Ra, linked down below, and despite promising to post it on his channel, he has yet to do so, despite it being more than a month ago. So let's see him try and recover some face in this video. Uh, if you want to get <coughs> one of our t-shirts with the world famous patch on it, uh, Dinosaur Adventure Land patch, we got some of these left. That's world famous? I keep tabs on you guys and this is the first time I've seen that patch, so I think calling it world famous is a bit of a stretch. Now, <coughs> the whole program is interviewing experts uh, on the topic over in England about, you know, should we teach evolution? And is it time for everybody to accept evolution? This is the tech. Nick typed this out here today. 75 years ago, the Church of England published the report of its commission on doctrine setting out what church members should believe. I would stop right there and say, hold on a minute. Why is the Church of England telling their people what to believe to start with? Well, first time for everything. I agree with you, Kent. Nobody has any business telling other people what they should believe. Teaching how to think critically should be the priority, something that is noticeably lacking in religious denominations, including Kent's. Okay, I think you got a real problem right now, just with that first half of that sentence, okay. But I think you should make a, a statement of what your church believes, and then let the people decide what they want. And when the people disagree with what the church says it believes, some of them split off and form their own denomination, which is how we now have tens of thousands of distinct denominations of the one true religion. Well, one of the one true religions anyway. Doctrine means teaching. The Bible has doctrinal, quite a few different doctrines. What's the Bible teaching on salvation or baptism, etc.? Sure. But the church had no problem at all with the idea of evolution. This is what their meeting said. Okay. It said, no objection to the theory of evolution could be drawn from the two creation narratives in Genesis 1 and 2. Stop right there. There are not two creation narratives in Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, yeah, there really are. Genesis 1 has man and woman created last and at the same time as each other. Genesis 2 has man created first, with God then creating animals and parading them past Adam for him to name and see if one of them would be a suitable helper. And when no suitable helper is found, God makes Eve out of Adam's rib. So Genesis 1, plants come first, followed by all the sea creatures and birds, followed by land animals, followed by humans, male and female at the same time. Genesis 2 has man created first, followed by God planting the Garden of Eden, followed by by the land animals and birds, followed by woman. Two very distinct and contradictory accounts of creation. Genesis 1 is a summary of the six days of creation. Genesis 2 goes back and fills in all the details of day 6. So in the details of day 6, God created birds? Because in Genesis 1, that was on day 5. Which is it? It's not a contradiction. It's not a different creation account. It's the same thing with more details. We cover that in great detail on video number seven of my award-winning video series. What award did it win? I really want to know. Okay, so I looked it up on drdino.com, and it said that it was recognized by Homeschool World as the number one educational video of the year. Now I homeschool my kids, and I have looked into a lot of resources, and I have never heard of Homeschool World before today. When googling it, the tagline for it says that it's the world's most visited homeschool site. I really want to know how they came by that title, considering there are literally dozens of other homeschool sites that not only look more professional, but have better content and better search engine optimization. I mean, I've, as an active homeschooler who has been looking for resources, I have not even stumbled across the site once until now. Now, that being said, I couldn't find the Educational Video of the Year award anywhere on their site, and a Google search for Homeschool World Educational Video of the Year didn't even have a link to the Homeschool World site on their first page. When I searched the Homeschool World page specifically, the first result was one of their pages recommending against videos as an educational tool. So I'm going to go ahead and call bullshit on that award. It seems like it is even less going for it than Kent's doctorate, and that's saying something. Uh, are there contradictions in the Bible between chapter 1 and chapter 2? No, and it's simple to explain. Anyway, since it is generally agreed among educated Christians, 
What are they trying to say here? This is a sneaky way they get their doc. In other words, if you don't believe in evolution, you're not educated or you're stupid. No, that's not what they're saying at all. It's just a simple fact that the more educated you are, the more likely you are to accept evolution. Ergo, more educated Christians are more likely to accept evolution and therefore take Adam and Eve as an allegorical myth. It is generally believed, agreed, among educated Christians that these are mythological in origin uh, and that the value for us is symbolic rather than historical. They're teaching their people, oh, this has a lesson for us, but it didn't really happen. Yeah, it demonstrably did not happen. So if you want to keep it around, you'd better find some sort of lesson in it or else it becomes obsolete. Yet 75 years later, many evangelical Anglicans, as well as members of other religions, cannot accept the idea that man evolved from other animals. They do this all the time in debates with me. Why don't you accept evolution? Yes, they do that in debates with you because evolution is something that has been demonstrated to be true. So it's not exactly a matter of belief. It's a matter of accepting the facts that are available. They don't want to use the word believe. Because believe is a loaded word which people usually associate with religion, which evolution is not. What is This implies that obviously it's true. Why can't you accept it? Exactly. They cannot accept the idea that man evolved from other animals. No, listen carefully, BBC News, and I'll come on and debate all the scientists you can find. I'll come debate them all if I get half the time. In the debate with Arne, I did not get half the time. I got 36 minutes. And instead of saying, oops, we're sorry, now on their program they're saying, well, because we had to correct you all the time. Well, he did. You were getting a lot wrong. He wasn't letting you get away with your usual gish gallop either, where you bring up 20 to 30 points that are all based in misinformation or are outright lies, and then claim victory when the person you're debating can't refute all of them in the time allotted. That's why you stick to formal debate style instead of conversational style, because you have to guarantee that you get equal time in order for your tactics to work. We cannot accept the idea <coughs> that man evolved from other animals. There is no evidence anywhere in the world of any animal producing anything other than its kind. What is a kind, Kent? The title of your video suggests that you answer that question here, so I expect an actual definition. Now, if you want to believe, not accept, believe in evolution, that is your business. But it is a religion in every sense of the word. He said here, something there is no serious scientific debate about. Now, hold it. What are they trying to say there? All scientists believe this, and if you don't, you must be stupid, or must be uneducated, or you're not really a scientist. The same things they say about me. No, I mean, if the shoe fits. And some even dispute that our planet is older than the biblical account of 6,000 years. Look at the way they phrase that. Some dispute that our planet is older. How dare you question the idea the Earth is 6,000 years old? Oh, it's billions of years old. They do this ridicule, mocking, just like in Nehemiah's day with the wall, you know, if a fox goes up, he's going to break down their wall. Uh, so this morning we are asking one very big question. Is it time all religions accept evolution as fact? Ideally, it's time for religions to disappear completely, but I know that won't happen in my lifetime, probably not my kids' lifetimes either. So accepting science would be a good compromise for now. Just the way they phrase their opening statement is sad. This is not BBC news. This is BBC propaganda. No, it's not either. Did you, did you, did you honestly think that was a clip from BBC news that you were playing? Like, no, it's a Q and A show. It's a debate show. Half the people they have to discuss the issue are on your side in the matter. How is an open discussion of both sides propaganda? But they accuse me, <coughs> they accuse me of not knowing science or ignoring problems with identifying kinds in the Bible. My favorite examples of you not knowing science are when you're in a debate and your opponent says something you clearly don't understand, and you say something along the lines of, well, of course I understand that, but please explain it in layman's terms so the audience can understand. You, I, my favorite debate with that one was uh, when you were talking to King Crocoduck. You said that so often. It was like every other sentence that he uttered, you had no clue what he was even talking about. So you had to ask him to explain it. But you, you taught science for 15 years, so you can't not understand these basic concepts. So explain it so a layman can understand it. Of course, I get it. But you should explain that so other people can get it. Now, Freddie, your son is five years old. We're going to give him a test in just a minute here, so pay attention. Don't go to sleep. You got it? Well, this should be good. 
Kent, he said a couple hours ago, Kent still in pain after the destruction by Aaron Ra? Hold on a minute. How many of you saw the debate with Aaron Ra? Did I get destroyed in that debate? I got interrupted 288 times. I'm not going to check that number, but I, I really do believe that you spent the time sitting there re-watching the debate, counting every time he interrupted you just so you could use that number. You seem like the kind of person who would be that petty. Why all the bleating, Kent? I'm not bleating about anything. I'm pointing out Bible is true, evolution is stupid. It's dumb, it's retarded, it's idiotic. And if you believe you came from a rock or from an ape-like ancestor, I feel sorry for you. See, that's what I'm talking about. A good chunk of that debate was Aaron explaining to you that no biologist believes that we came from rocks. He even tried to explain how that misconception started with the whole rain on the rocks thing that you always use, but you stubbornly refused to listen and kept insisting that evolutionists believe that we came from rocks. Honestly, could you imagine your frustration with us if we insisted that Christians don't believe in the Trinity no matter how many times you tell me that you do? Would that be a fruitful discussion at all, or would that maybe be rather pointless? And a better argument could be made for the Bible not teaching the Trinity than can be made to suggest that evolution started with rocks. He said, what is a kind? LOL, still waiting. Okay, Ross, I'll try to help you out one more time. I'm going to use small words so you can get it, okay? Just incredible, you still peddle the same nonsense after being corrected. No, no, just because you guys disagree and state your disagreement, that does not mean I was corrected. Yes, it does. When you say, evolutionists believe we came from a rock, and then the evolutionist you are currently talking to says, no, we don't, that is you being corrected. Sorry, but that's just how it works. Even if he doesn't provide any evidence, we're talking about a belief statement here. You don't get to dictate what other people believe. Even if you find a textbook that actually says we came from rocks, which you can't, you just find passages that are oversimplified to the point where it is kind of possible to draw that erroneous conclusion. But even if a textbook explicitly says that we came from a rock, textbooks are not evolutionist Bibles. Some of them, in fact, I would wager most of them, have mistakes, and those mistakes are corrected in future editions. Textbooks do not dictate our beliefs. I might have been correct already, and you're the ones that are wrong. Show me where I have been corrected. You're the one that keeps saying if they bring forth, which is the definition of species, not kind. I keep correcting you on this, but you do not correct yourself. That's why after 20 years, you still repeat the idea that I'm supposed to believe that we came from a rock, even though I've seen a dozen people correct you on this very point, and you've never fixed it. It doesn't need fixed. Evolution does teach. Yeah, we came nobody from a rock. believes. No evolutionary biologist, nobody promoting evolutionists believes we came from a rock. Nobody. That is okay. a lie on your part, which you have never corrected. Everything brings forth after Every farmer in the history of the world counts on evolution not happening. They count on it. Rather the opposite, actually. Most farmers grow crops that have been artificially bred for certain beneficial traits and bred in ways that would not be possible if evolution were false. Yes, organisms reproduce after their kind, as you say, and speaking cladistically, we are all the same kind as our ancestors no matter how far back you go. That's why Arn could say that at a certain level, pine trees and elephants are the same kind because they are both eukaryotes, and he explained that to you. But if you don't like that pine trees and elephants are the same kind in that fashion, then it's on you to provide a definition of the word kind so that we can know that they aren't. I, they, they think... They think we cannot define what a kind is. I think I can, pretty simply. And I'm not uh, in pain over the destruction by Aaron Ra. I'm shocked that a guy like that with a high school diploma has so much people, so many people supporting him. Are you really shitting on Aaron's education right now, Mr. Doctorate that had to be bought from an unaccredited diploma mill? That's a pissing contest that I'm pretty sure you don't want to get into with Aaron. Anyway, what is a kind? Okay, Aaron, you interrupted me 288 times, so I'll try to explain it one more time. This is stuff I showed you that night, and I'll show Ross now. There are two kinds, two varieties. I, I use the word kind kind of loosely. Yeah, no kidding. That's the whole problem. There are two varieties of squirrels that live on opposite sides of the Grand Canyon, Kaibab squirrel and the Abert squirrel. They probably had a common ancestor. There are 200 varieties of squirrels. Actually, there are 200 species of squirrels in the world, according to National Pornographic. 200 species. It's called the squirrel kind. Okay, you're five. 
would you say this animal and this animal and this animal are the same kind of animal? Yes, no. No. No? <laughs> God, Kent, that's your own test that you say is a foolproof way to define a kind, and the kid disagrees with you. That's priceless. So, these are called the horse kind, Ross and R, and I'm trying to help you now. These are the same kind of animal. They're not a squirrel, they're not a pine tree, they're not a whale, okay? But are they part of mammal kind? What about vertebrate kind? You carry out kind? I'm still waiting for a definition. You're simply providing examples that nobody would disagree with. If you want to be useful, then do what Arin challenged you to do. Present an example of a created kind. A kind of animal that does not fit cladistically in any other group, and can be shown that God created this kind distinct from any other kind. Horses, or the equine kind, fit perfectly within the perisodactyla kind. That is, the odd-toed ungulates. Does this mean that horses and rhinos are the same kind? Perisodactyl kind fits perfectly within the ungulate kind, which includes cattle, pigs, giraffes, camels, deers, hippos, basically anything with hooves. The ungulate kind fits perfectly within the scrotifera kind, which includes such animals as bats and dolphins. I could go on and on, but basically what it comes down to is all these animals that you're showing, we have a traceable phylogeny that goes back to common ancestors from millions of years ago, and it's all very well supported scientifically. So if you want to dissent with that opinion, you need to provide an example of a unique created kind that doesn't fit inside another kind. I think it's pretty obvious it's the same kind. I shared with you that they've tried, gotten horses in the last 100 years. They've cut the winning speed from Kentucky Derby, 127 seconds to 123 average. That's after spending how much money on selective breeding trying to get the fastest horse? Millions and millions of dollars. I say, look, breed wings on the horse and fly around the track. Then you'd win or put a jet engine on it. Find a horse with bird wings like that, and that will go a long way to demonstrating creationism. Were the distant descendants of horses to actually have wings of some kind, they would not be at all similar to bird wings because of how they would have to evolve. If anything, they'd be closer to bat wings because at least bats are closer evolutionarily speaking to horses than birds are. There are now th two to three hundred varieties of this African fish. A cichlid, I think they call it, or cichlid, I don't know how you pronounce it. How many cichlids are there? Cichlids are there, okay. Well, the new species are discovered annually. I read an article, they were so excited they found a new species of cichlid. It said, see, this proves evolution. It's a fish. Apparently all fish are now the same kind, which seems to violate his rule about bringing forth. This is why we need you to define it, Kent. You're all over the map. You know, fish, <laughs> the same kind of animal. It might have different fin shape, and you might decide to call it a new species and get all excited because you're looking for evidence for your dumb religion. It's still a fish. The Bible says they bring forth after their kind. And not all fish bring forth with all other fish. So are there more than one kind of fish, or are all fish the same kind? Be consistent, please, Kent. But the textbooks will make these phylogenetic trees that Aaron is so excited about, all the lines they drew on paper connecting them. Wow, look at this, boys and girls. We have drawn a line to connect animals and fungi and plants. See that line on there? That's proof. In their mind it is, isn't it? Yeah. No, Kent. The line is not proof. And that's another point that Arne corrected you on. Creationists seem to be under the impression that every single thing that is put out there that uses evolution as a base is itself an attempt to prove evolution. Whether it be a paper that uses evolution as a core assumption, or a museum sign that has animals connected in a phylogeny. Well, I hate to break it to you, but as far as the scientific community is concerned, the overarching theory of evolution has met its burden of proof. There may still be arguments about how certain aspects of evolution happen, but there aren't any papers being published purely to verify the accuracy of evolution as a whole. That has been done. The line on the paper is not supposed to convince anyone, it's just to show the relationships between the organisms or the groups that they name. And if you want to look into the specifics, you can. 
In fact, Arin's main project right now is the Phylogeny Explorer project, where all those lines will be filled in with all of the organisms. So you won't be able to claim that the lines represent assumptions because they will all be there. And I can't wait to use it as a reference for my videos. That will save me a lot of Googling time. Well, it's all based on what they're comparing. Well, it, they compare whatever they want to compare. Cytochrome C, compare bone structure, compare... What, what do you want? You can compare it a thousand different ways and get a thousand different lines. Except they find that when they compare heritable traits, it always comes up the same way, with the exception that the further back in time you go, the less certain the placement becomes. The bat kind is a kind, and the Bible says they will bring forth after their kind. Now, they might have varieties, big ones and little ones, but they're always the same kind of animal. They will never change to anything but a bat. And he said that many times in the debate or discussion, I'm sorry. The, yeah, of course nobody believes dogs produce non-dogs. Dogs will always produce dogs. Funny how you heard him say that, yet you still insisted on going on and on about how dogs always produce dogs. Okay. But did they come from a non-dog? I mean, you go back far enough, they had to come from a non-dog, didn't they? You're not quite getting it. You see, in cladistic phylogeny, something can never become something that is outside of its ancestry. As in, once eukaryotes developed, all of their subsequent descendants were all eukaryotes. Once the spine developed, all of their subsequent descendants were vertebrates, etc. So canine is a category that develops slowly within the mammal category, which develops slowly within the vertebrate category, etc., etc., and so on. As evolution progresses, the categories become more and more specialized, but nothing outgrows its ancestry. Whales are still tetrapods, despite not having hind limbs, because of their ancestry and because of the fact that tetrapods will always bring forth more tetrapods after the tetrapod kind. How come it could happen long ago and far away, but it can't happen today? See, all fairy tales start that way. Long ago and far away. In the beginning, long ago, God created the Garden of Eden, far away. Yep, it fits. Must be a fairy tale. So they keep saying, Hovind doesn't know what a kind is. I think a five-year-old knows what a kind is. Well, apparently not the one in the room with you. Either that or you need to change your concept of what a kind is. If you had an orange tree growing next to an apple tree, is it possible that the branches would intertwine? Sure. Okay. Is it possible you'll see an orange growing on a branch that's actually right in amongst the apples? Yes. Does that prove that they're related? Yeah. No. Because you go down to the roots and that's where it stops. Which is precisely why Aaron wanted you to give a specific example of a created kind that can't be traced back to a common ancestry with another kind using phylogeny. And remember, if you think phylogeny is simply drawing lines on a piece of paper arbitrarily, then you don't know what phylogeny is. They're not coming off the same tree. Right. Now, you might find an animal that has uh, four feet, like a horse, and another animal that has four feet, like a dog. And they say, wow, look at these similarities. They're right next to each other. We can compare all these similarities. Yeah, but they're coming off of a different tree. Yeah, the tetrapod tree. One tree which is a branch of the vertebrate tree. Well, that's about as much Hovind as I can handle at the moment, so I'll just leave it there. Remember to follow me on Twitter and Facebook and support me on Patreon. See you next time.